Hey everybody, Mike Spector the Comics and I'm back. This time I'm doing a tag challenge from my buddy Mike from Night Tiger Comics. I'm going to be showing off my top 10 gimmick covers. If you're interested in seeing what I got, stay tuned for that intro. Alright, so welcome back. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Hit that bell notification when I do put out some content you get in a timely fashion. Like I said, um, Mike from Night Tiger Comics, he ended up doing like a tag challenge, basically a tag for the community. So um, feel free to make a video for your channel as well. Um, basically, your top 10, you know, gimmick covers from whatever, any period, of, you know, during your comic books. Um, most of these will be 90s-ish related. Um and that's basically when the you know the gimmick cover started was in the uh, early the early 90s early to late 90s um so i got a bunch of fun ones here that i, I picked up some of these were more modern um more recent than the uh than the 90s some of them were from like the you know early 2000s as well but um they still fit you know fit into the uh the gimmicks um wasn't able to pick up some of the, you know, more books I wanted to show off because some of my books are in, um, are in storage. So I pretty much just went through a, you know, a quick long box and a short box and just gathered a bunch of books. And, uh, that's what I'm going to present for the challenge. So, um, in no particular order, I'm just going to grab a stack and, uh, we're just going to show it off. So, uh, first one is going to be probably one of the more obscure, um, I guess gimmicks, if you want to call it. Um, I don't really, I don't know if I call it a gimmick or if it's just something different. But um, I was watching Roger's video, and uh, he did show a double feature. So I didn't even think about this as being a gimmick. But um, I do have a double feature comic. And this came out, I think, a couple of years ago. And I do like my, um, my horror books. So this is from Dark Horse Comics. This is shop, shop number one. And as you can see, you got the one cover on the front. And on the back, you got another cover. And it's two different stories um, told, and you actually read it the way it's presented. Um, I actually like the back cover on here. It's really sweet with the skulls. But I uh, open it up. Has one story there. You flip it over. Different story. So um, they call it a double feature. It's pretty cool. Um, so that will be my number one. All right. And I believe they did that for the entire series, if I'm not mistaken. It's been a while since I've read that. Um, the next one, so the next one kind of, you know, it, it, it came about in like, I guess the late nineties, um, remember when or what the first book was that kind of started this. And then it just started to slowly explode into the early two thousands and until now. So it's been going on for about two decades now and it's kind of like created its own, like separate genre in comics with this particular i call it a gimmick um some people might not but it is the virgin variant um like i said virgin variants in the late 90s weren't really kind of didn't really kick off it wasn't it wasn't anything you know too popular um I, like i said i don't recall what the first you know book was that was a virgin variant but um this is, uh, the book itself is Moon Knight, Black, White, and Blood, issue number one. And um, I want to say this is probably an Eddie, Eddie Granoff cover. Really nice cover. But, like, nowadays, you see Virgin variant covers for, geez, so many store exclusives. Um, so many different, you know, number ones, number twos, and so on. And you even see, um, you know, content creators coming out with their own Virgin variant, you know, exclusive. So 
it's <laughs> it's become like mainstream now. But um, back then, it was kind of like a brand new thing. So I don't know if you want to call it a you know comic gimmick. Sure, you know it, it's a little different. But uh, like I said, I'm you know working with some uh, working. It's a little difficult for me because uh, like I said, like a good 80, 85 percent of my comics are in storage. So I, you know some of the stuff that I wanted to pull out, I just didn't have uh, in hand. Um, like for this next book, this book is a classic book. This will be number three. Um, I had, I think, one or two other books that I wanted to show off uh, for this category of cover cover gimmick. But um, this was the only one I had in hand. And it's because it's one of my, you know, really cool key books. And uh, this is Batman the Killing Joke. We all know this book. Classic, classic uh, cover. Great story. Um, and it made my number three because it's an embossed, embossed cover. And it's not the entire cover. It's partially embossed, and it's just here on the trade. I don't know if it will show off well. Let me take it out. It might not. Um, but you see there how there's a little bit of embossing there on the trade versus the cover itself, which is not. Um, so this, and this was another one that I could have easily used as uh, a cover, you know, comic gimmick is additional printings. Uh, this book, for example, had, I believe, nine printings. I don't have the ninth printing. This is actually the first printing. Um, so I do have the first printing, and I'll show you the other one I have. Because this will be my second example for, uh, for uh, you know, embossed covers. And um, trying to get it back in the sleeve. Without ruining it. Right, I'm just going to put that aside. And then the second one I have here is the uh, seventh printing. And um, I wouldn't know offhand it was. I had to look this up. But... Um, this is the seventh printing because it's yellow. I don't know. There's so many different shades, <laughs> and uh, they all mean different printings based off of the uh, the trade the trade color. But um, yeah, this is the only part of the book that's embossed is the trade dress. So uh, that is number three embossed covers. Like I said, I had a, one or two other ones that were really really cool embossed covers. Uh, unfortunately, I had to show like a very minimal embossed cover for that one. So number three. All right, I'm um, going on to number four, and this one may, you know, also not be. I don't know. On the fence on this one, whether it's um, considered a gimmick, but I'm gonna run with it. So this one is going to be when I was going off of my previous thing saying that you know additional printings could have easily on my side being you know considered um, a gimmick because when the publisher was coming out you know a certain amount of print run for a, uh, an additional printing they could have you know said well we're only going to do 500 for the second print and if they sell out they sell out you know, the third print can be 750 and so forth. So they can, you know, guesstimate how many based off of, you know, pre-orders and then if they wanted to print out some more. So um, there was a lot of companies, even more recently now, that, you know, have had, you know, five, six, seven, eight printings. And um, it just got really out of hand. And they just, sometimes it would be same cover or it would be an entirely new cover. Um, but, they did. DC did something very notorious back in the 90s with um, what I'm going to show you is my next gimmick. And uh, this is the DC Universe label. So um, the DC Universe logo is, you know, for a while now starting to become, you know, more and more collected. When you're out there hunting for books, um, we knew these came out back in the '90s, and 
they only showed up in DC multi packs. So these were reprinted from the original. So the original would have, you know, whatever logo that was on there. If it was a Batman, you know, title, for example, I have one here. If it was a Batman title, it would have like a Batman logo on there. Um, then you had your new your new stand, your barcode for your if you bought it at a new stand. And then your reprints would have these logos on it. So it could be a second printing, a third printing, you know, usually no more than three. It was usually a second or third printing. And depending on the book, it could be fairly scarce um, out there. Um, I believe like this one, for example, is probably on the scarcer side than say Batman. Because everyone who was buy buying DC was either buying Batman or Detective Comics or like Wonder Woman, for example, versus the Animaniacs, who <laughs> I can't imagine a lot of people were buying Animaniacs in general. So uh, ideally, this would be more scarce than a Batman title, especially like when you start getting to these, these issues, these were like heavily... Um, in general, printed more so the uh, Animaniacs. I think I have one more over here as well, but um, I do actually. There you go. Here's another Batman. This is Batman issue number uh, 507. And I've come up, I found this issue in the wild multiple times with the uh, DC Universe label. And, uh, but yeah, as you can see, they're much easier to find these in the Batman and uh, DC titles. Versus like an Animaniacs or Looney Tunes, um, something like that, you know, a little bit more more obscure. And you would often notice <clears throat> that the DC Universe labels would also be different colors. So they almost have like almost like a rainbow color depending on the title. So you could see the Batman's white uh, background and then the Animaniacs has this kind of beige, like off-white cream looking uh, background. I've had different colors in the past as well. But yeah, so I'm using that as my number four is the DC Universe logo uh, variants. It's like a, a minor cover gimmick. <laughs> Just roll with it. Roll with it for me. All right, so that was four. Let's go with number five. Number five, this is a cool one. Um, this is the only one I have on me, uh, but these these type of covers were pretty cool. It showed like an image on the cover, and then you would open it up and you get more. And so by me saying that, you probably know where I'm getting at with that. And uh, the example I'm going to show is Incredible Hulk, issue number 418. And what is cool about this, it's a die cut cover. And there's some pretty elaborate ones out there. Um, this is the only one I have. And uh, obviously it shows the cover of a marriage. And inside you get all the people that were there attending it. Pretty cool. Um, I believe this is a key issue as well. I want to say it's probably like first appearance of Talos or something like that. I don't know. Um, but really cool, depending on whatever it was, they got pretty, you know, pretty elaborate with the uh, die cut covers. Um, this one's, this one's a pretty neat one because it has like the heart shape on it for the marriage, which is neat. I like that. I think I have another one, one of these somewhere. And it's also a wraparound cover, as you can see as well. So it's kind of like a two for one. Two for one uh, cover gimmick. Really nice. Only example I have with me, so uh, that's all I got for this one. So that will be Incredible Hulk number 418, the die cut cover gimmick. So that is my number five. All right. So we're halfway through. We're going to do with number six. Um, this is going to be another one that you're just going to have to 
roll with me on that one. And um, and this one, let me see. Like I said, this one for number six, you kind of just gonna have to roll with me on this one. Um, these, I'm gonna call it cover gimmicks because these are covers that are often replicated based off of a famous image, um, a famous, you know, whether it's from a movie, a poster, um, a previous comic book, whatever it may be. I think you know what I'm talking about. This is the cover homage. So uh, in the 90s, there were a lot of famous comic books that were heavily homaged, um, whether they were from the 90s or earlier. We all know the famous Action Comics number one. That was probably the first cover, you know, like that. the oldest cover that was homaged was that one. We saw that time and time again. In the 90s, we saw it heavily with Todd McFarlane's covers. We saw it with ASM 300. We saw it with Spider, you know, and then Spider-Man 1. Um, basically, he would homage his own covers. <laughs> You've seen it in Spawn. You've seen it in further, you know, future Spider-Man titles and so forth. Um, it, it was just like absolutely wild. So I'm going to show you two of my examples I have with me. I probably have at least a couple of handfuls of them. But uh, first one's going to be um, one that people probably won't show. And this is going to be Incredible Hulk issue number 441. And uh, this was homaged from a famous movie. This is called the... Pulp Fiction homage, and you can see on there on the bottom, she's holding a little book there that says Pulp Fiction, you know, and you can tell, obviously, the classic, classic cover. Um, great cover. I, I love this cover. And uh, you can just, yeah, enough said. Another one that people might not show off for an homage is this cover. This is uh, a little bit more recent. This is Deadpool issue number five. Really cool cover. I love these uh, Garbage Pail Kids um, stickers that they did back in the 80s and 90s. They probably still do them now. I have no clue. But uh, this is Deadpool's version of the Garbage Pail Kids sticker. And you can see that they got the outline there above. Obviously, the famous, you know, trade dress that they used with the different characters. This was Reckless Wade. And, uh, yeah really fun covers I, I love these really cool so yeah number six the cover homage all right number seven so number seven is um something that was you know heavily used in the 90s and um you know this was the i'm just gonna go with it the poly bag poly bag cover uh cover gimmick so um what they would you know, often do, not always, but uh, sometimes they would have like a, you know, a little face on there with a the cover, you know, sleeve. Um, sometimes it would be just clear plastic with the comic book. It just depended on what they wanted to do when they released it. Uh, this one, for example, hardware, it would say collector's edition. And um, on there it would tell you what it included. So hardware number one, the comic book, four panels, 16 panel mural. Uh, sometimes it would have a poster in it, sometimes it wouldn't, and it also came with a trading card, <laughs> all for the great cheap price of two ninety five, <laughs> which was, you know, back then, it's that was a lot. That was a lot for a, a comic book back then in the nineties. Um, you know, compared to, they, I don't know, it, it just depends on what it was, but um, yeah. <clears throat> um, so many, even even today, you still get from time to time, you get the uh, polybag books. I had one, or maybe it was two years ago. Yeah, so they're still releasing them from time to time, depending on the publisher. I feel like you're probably more often to see them in indie publishers now than the uh, Marvel and DC. But, you know, they all still make them. Um, but this is a really neat one. Yeah, probably not something you'd, you know often see with the, with the poly bags, you're probably going to see something that's more like DC, DC related. Like you'd often see the Superman. Um, I think it's Superman 75. And 
Adventures of Superman 500, those classic, you know, black covers with the Superman logo. They did them in the, po you know, poly bag with the black cover, the platinum. It, it was just like wild. Um, that would have been another one to show off. Was it would have been like the uh, platinum, platinum trade dress and the gold, platinum, uh, gold platinum trade dresses that I, I don't have any of those, uh, unfortunately, because that would have been a cool one to add. So yeah, there you go. That's number, number eight. That's number no, sorry, number seven. All right, moving on. Number eight. Um, we're just going to get right into this. When you think of 90s, you often think of foil, right? You know, 90s foily madness. Um, this one's going to be more on the simpler side when I show these off. And um, <clears throat> classic cover. This is Danger Girl number one from IDW. This was also an homage from the original Danger Girl number two. Uh, so I could have used this as an homage as well, but uh, I'm going to use this for foil. As you can see, this is minimally foil. Um, I, I call this tasteful foil, yeah. <laughs> if, if you have to have a thing. Tasteful foil, because it's just a trade dress, and then a little bit here on the bottom where it says revolver. Let me see if I get some good lighting. There you go. There you go. You got some foil there. There you go. And you see it on the... Revolver. Boom. <clears throat> I call that tasteful foil. And uh, this is very minimal. There's another one is Gears of War. And then Gears of War, it's just a tray dress. You can see just a little bit of foil there. And then everything else is just a regular cover. I like that. It's, you know, simple. It's just a nice little added touch. Um, but, you know, they got a little ridiculous in the 90s with... Um, with the complete foil covers. So I'm gonna show you an example, but more modern. This is from uh, late 20 teens. This will be number nine. And this is like the textured foil, I guess you wanna call it, the cover gimmick. Textured foil, which is completely different than what I just showed you with just foil. So this will be an example. This is like 90s foily madness right here, but more modern, look at that absolutely craziness and uh, <clears throat> the difference between this and the previous foil is just the way they laid it out the texture you can see it is quite the texture to it um, and this is on you know the front and the back the back this is a more traditional foil as you can see there's no texture whatsoever compared to the front cover which you can see all like the different grooves and stuff like that on the cover. And this is uh, Curse of Brimstone, issue number seven. Um, towards the end of the late 20 teens, uh, DC reintroduced the foil and um, like the texture foil. I'll show you another example. And it was like through, I think, all of their titles um, for a brief period. It was like probably like a year. This is Justice League Dark, issue number four. And this was another one that was the uh, another example of that textured foil. And uh, really neat. I gotta take this out of the out of the bag because it, it really sometimes it doesn't show you the ju you know justice of the actual cover. So like the back of it, same thing as the yellow one. So it came out right around the same time. But look at that. Really neat. And uh, it almost looked like it would be, you know, like like this would glow in the dark. But this doesn't actually glow in the dark, which is unfortunate. Because um, I would have loved to show this off for a glow in the dark cover. I had a really neat glow in the dark cover, but it's not with me. It's in storage, which would have been another nice uh, cover gimmick to show. But yeah, um, I'm going to call this number nine. Kind of like my textured foil. And then the last one is... Um, a really iconic cover, you know, um, that, you know, came about. This company was well known in the 90s. Uh, this is Valiant I'm talking about. You know, when you think of indie companies in the 90s, it was like Valiant and Image. Image started it and then, you know, was, was like the big company that actually survived. 
Um, Valiant, unfortunately, did not. Um, <clears throat> but this one title ended up coming out with a really cool cover that still from time to time today, you'll see some, you know, companies come out with them from time to time. And uh, <clears throat> I believe this was the first of this cover gimmick, if I'm not mistaken. I'd have to check the good old notes on this, but I'm pretty sure this was. And um, this is the Chromium cover. Really cool. Let me show you. This is Bloodshot, issue number one. And look at that thing. This thing pops. Oh, uh, look at that. Bring that closer. That is really cool. I love these Chromium covers. Um, it's like just on the front cover. The back cover doesn't have anything. It's just a traditional back cover. But like the cover itself is significantly thicker than anything else. It's like layered on here as well. It's like a little textured uh, layered piece separate from the cover just just this portion right here very very shiny as you would expect with a you know chrome finish and it's a really neat cover as well um this was a fun series i don't know if you guys ever read bloodshot but uh, lots of action but that is my number 10 chromium so let me know what you guys think um I thought these are pretty pretty cool covers, really cool examples of uh, cover gimmicks. If you have a channel, like I said, it's an open tag challenge. Feel free to do it yourself. Show off your top 10 gimmick cards. There's a lot of cool gimmicks out there. Um, there was a bunch of them that I did not show off that I wish I had with me that I would have showed off. You could do like gatefold covers. You could do connecting covers. Jeez, hollow foil um embossed foil there's so many glow in the dark you know that i just wanted to show off that i didn't have with me unfortunately so have fun with it take on the challenge it's a really cool one it's it's a good you know challenge to build a community with um that i appreciate mike night tiger from doing it so uh in the comments down below let me know what you guys think and until next time mark spec the comics